Thank you. I am so honored to be here and so blessed. And thank you, Pastor Paul, for the opportunity. Like he said, I, I literally just gave him the title of the message. And he's like, yes, I want you to teach this. So I was very blessed by that. I felt trusted. So thank you, Pastor. And thank you, Resonate, for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I, um, I'm, we're going to have more fun this service, I'm just letting you know, because I've had a dry run already for service, and I'm going to do it even better this service, so I hope you're ready to do this with me. Um, we're going to have fun today. So, um, the message that I want to bring to you today is six months worth of ponderings, so I apologize. Um, this is, I'm, I, I attempted to shove six months worth of dialogues with the Lord into one message Maybe this should have been like five, um, but we're going to try it in one. So forgive me already. We're going to like drink from a fire hydrant today. As much as I can, I'm going to do the best that I can to communicate this. So, But this actually was birthed out of um, a Bible study we did a couple months ago. We did a Bible study called Second Nature um, in the women's ministry. Anybody do that one with me? Anybody? Just a couple of you? I got a couple of you. Okay, so Second Nature is actually the first study that I wrote. And I loved this study. I had so much fun with it. Um, and what we did, what we've been doing in women's ministry is we've been taking um, portions of Scripture and just, like, allowing the Lord to speak to it, straight word of God, and allow the Lord to speak to us on it. And it's been such a rich study. We've loved it. But when I put this one together, so it was my responsibility, right, to put together all the, mess, or the, all the verses we're going to go through. And somehow this verse got into our Bible study three times. And I, I, I wrote it, guys, and I didn't know it. So <laughs> I was like, at the end, by the time I got to it the third time, I'm like, this one again? Like, why did you do this, Hannah? But at the same time, it was on the third time I went through it that this, this revelation came to me. Um, and what we did is we ended each study with like, or each day of study with like a fix, something that we're going to take from today. Um, and my fix for this passage is what um, the title of our uh, messages today, and it's it's love at the expense of justice. And so the passage we're going to go through is this. I'm going to read it in the Passion Translation. It's Matthew 5, 43 to 48. It says, your ancestors have also been taught, love your neighbors and hate the one who hates you. However, I say to you, love your enemy. Bless the one who curses you. Do something wonderful for the one who hates you. And respond to the very ones who persecute you by praying for them. For that will reveal your identity as children of your heavenly Father. He is kind to all by bringing the sunrise to warm and rainfall to refresh whether a person does what is good or evil. What reward do you deserve if you love only the lovable? Don't even the tax collectors do that. How are you any different? How are you any different from others if you limit your kindness only to your friends. Don't even the ungodly do that. Since you are children of a perfect father in heaven, become perfect like him. Low standard, right? No, no problem with this one. Y'all got this? Y'all ready to go home? Well, just in case you're like me, I took six months to actually work this one through. And what the Lord kind of brought to me, and he gave me this, this illustration, there's, there's two ways that I think we as believers respond to this verse. I've heard this verse taught, like, most of my life. Um, and I, I've seen people respond to it in two different ways, and, and usually it's the first way. So I know very little about cars, but I do know this. I have learned this over the years. Every once in a while, my car will try to pull to, like, the right or to the left, Right? You guys ever experienced that? And your car just like pulls one way. Well, you and I know that that means that our wheels, our tires are out of alignment. Correct? But to solve this problem, I've seen people do it two different ways. Either they muscle their car onto the road, and they get really sore after a while trying to keep their car on track, or they drive it to a mechanic and have someone get under the car and straighten the wheels out, right? I've seen people use this verse two different ways, in those two ways. Some people muscle themselves into alignment with the word. Well, I guess I have to do it because Jesus told me to, right? Um, or we can get under the car, figure out why the wheels are out of alignment, and get them back into alignment again, okay? So my goal today is to do option number two because of this, okay? If, if all you can do is muscle your car into alignment and stay and do your best to stay on the road, 
great, good for you. But I want to tell you, you're capable of more. Okay, Jesus, when he came, he didn't come to eliminate the law. He came to fulfill the law. And so when he did, he actually didn't lower the standard. Okay, some people think, well, we don't live by the law anymore, so the, the standard is super easy. Actually, the, Jesus raised the standard. Okay, he said, because in here, in the law, it says, love your neighbor, not your enemy. It says, love your neighbor. He says, I tell you to love your neighbor and love your enemy. How many of you guys know that's a harder standard to meet? Okay, but he gave that standard. He would not be a good God if he gave a standard we were incapable of fulfilling. Okay, so Jesus came and brought a different standard, a higher standard, because he was about to do something incredible. He was about to give you a new nature. Okay, like Taylor talked about last week, he came to give you a new nature, and in your new nature, you were about to become capable of more. So I want to encourage you, if you have been muscling onto the road, you're capable of more. You're capable of so much more. And even if all you can do is give, begrudgingly give a gift, if that's what you can do, if that's what you've done, good. Thank you for doing that. But anybody like to receive a gift that somebody doesn't want to give them? Anybody like that? Okay, love is a gift in its nature. Love is a gift, but we as a society have related to love according to a transaction. Okay, we, um, love has become a transaction. I give you something and you give me something. That's why it's easy to love your neighbor because your neighbor's kind to you. So it's easy to be kind in return, right? But that is a trans, if that's the only way that we relate to love, it is a transaction in nature. It is not a gift. And love is a gift always. So, Transactional love is not going to change anything. But a gift of love will. Okay? I love, it. further it says, um, if, you, if you continue in what Jesus was saying, he talks about how if um, someone tells you to carry their things a mile, carry it two miles. If someone takes your um, coat, take your, give them your tunic as well. Okay? Understand the first one was taken, the second one was given. Okay, if all I give is what was taken, that's not a gift. It's not love, okay? But when they gave that second one, that was the act of love. That's why Jesus said to do that, give love, okay? Does that make sense? So, that's my intro. I hope you're ready <laughs> to get into this with me. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quick pray over this myself because I want to do this really well, this service. I think the Lord has something extra for you guys. So I'm, will you pray with me a second? Um, dear Lord, I pray that you would give us a new revelation. I pray that you would open our hearts. Lord, we, we, we choose, Father, to make ourselves vulnerable today, to go to the mechanic shop and ask you, ask you what's going on in my heart. Uh, and I pray, Lord, that you would empower us with um, your new nature that you've put inside of us. I pray that you would teach us how to tap in to what you've given us and that we would learn to relate to one another and to the people around us in a new way. Lord, I pray that you would give me clarif clarification, that you would give me clarity of thought and of mind, and that this would be communicated perfectly for every single person in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're talking about loving our enemies, loving the people that rub us wrong. Okay, I'm not just talking about the people across the sea, you know, the people that you can't see that are on TV. The people, those are people who are easy to love sometimes because you can just pretend like you're doing it, right? You're never face-to-face -face with them, so it's easy to say, oh, yeah, I love them. But then you come face-to-face. -face. Okay, so I'm talking about the people you're face-to-face -face with. Okay, I'm talking about that sister you can't get rid of. There's no teenagers in this room, right? Sorry, I saw a couple in here. Um, I'm talking about um, the boss that's passed you over for a promotion. How many times? The boss that doesn't know how to lead a staff because they suck for whatever reason. I've seen one or two of those on Facebook, right? I have, I'm talking about the coworker that irritates you, that doesn't see things the way that you do, the people that don't hold the same values that you do. 
okay? And you can't handle that they don't carry your values too. It bugs you, because how can you not, right? I'm talking about the spouse that doesn't always get things right. <laughs> I'm not speaking from experience. <laughs> they work with me, so. Uh, I'm talking about um, I'm talking about that annoying uncle that comes to Thanksgiving dinner every week, right? Every year. That's not every week, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> the people you see once a year that you try to avoid at the other 365 days of the year, right? I'm talking about those people. Okay, I'm talking about those people. I found it very easy to love my neighbor. I don't know about y'all, um, but the Lord has taught me over years how to love people. Okay, and I found it easy to love. Um, to love my neighbor. I found it easy to love my coworkers. I found it easy to love people I didn't know. The Lord taught me how to do that, how to, how to see value in people that I knew nothing about. But where I struggled personally were, was with the people who wronged me. That's where I struggled personally. And so that's the journey that he took me on. Um, and whenever we do this, whenever I do something like this, the Lord always brings me back to the beginning. I've been pondering um, the story in Genesis um, for a long time, I've taught much about it, I feel like, recently. Um, but it always brings me back here to understand what is the origin, what's going on when I'm choosing to hate my enemy, what's going on under the surface. And so um, what he brings me back to all the time is Genesis 3, and it's at the fall of man. And if you guys remember, um, Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Right? So understand, when they ate of that tree, they possessed now a knowledge the Lord didn't intend them to carry. Okay, this isn't something that the Lord had designed them for. There's a reason he withheld it. It wasn't for their, it wasn't to withhold something from them, it was for their good. Okay, but when we ate of that, we took on um, a self-proclaimed position of judge. Right? Um, because now I possess the knowledge, I see good and I see evil, I possess this knowledge so I must be qualified to judge, right? That's the position that we took on. Um, if you remember, I spoke about this a couple months ago on Mother's Day. I talked about how we judge ourselves. We determine ourselves to be worthy or unworthy based on our actions, right? Anybody remember bits or pieces, maybe? Okay, we judge ourselves based on our actions, and we judge ourselves worthy or unworthy based on our actions. And if you remember my message, um, I told you, you no longer possess the right to define you. You have been remade. You have a new nature. And you are no longer defined by what you do. Okay, if you enjoyed that, if you picked any part of that up, if you applied any part of that to your life, I'm sorry to tell you, but you also picked up another responsibility. Because just like you are no longer defined according, defined according to what you do, no longer are they defined according to what they do. Okay? No longer is their worth based upon their actions. But isn't that what we do? Right? Your worth to me is determined by how well or how poorly you treat me. Yes? Is that what we do? This is the position of judge that we've taken up. You've wronged me, so you no longer have worth in my eyes, and I'm going to find some way to punish you. Okay? Can I say hate is a form of punishment? Okay, it's, the intention is to punish. That's the heart within us, that we became judge, jury, and executioner, and we need to make them pay. But see, here's the thing. Here's what's going on under the surface, okay? We entered a mode of self-defense, we needed to protect ourselves. Okay? I, you've wronged me. Something was wrong. I see good and I see evil and I see that what you did to me was wrong and now I'm going to make you pay for it. And we enter into this mode for self-defense, but here's the problem with that. We're not good judges. Okay, you know, in my household, do you know who's not a good judge? Judah. He makes a lot of judgment calls in his own warped perspective. He makes a lot of judgment calls, and he thinks he's good-hearted in it all. He, this is right. This is just, right? 
the other day, we, um, it was early in the morning, which is not that early, for, but for Everly, it's very early. Um, <laughs> it's like 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock or something like that. But Judah has fruit snacks. And he, in his good heart and his good nature, wants to share them with his sister. His sister, however, is still waking up. And, you know, something funny about her, she doesn't like getting food shoved in her face. <laughs> like any normal person, she doesn't appreciate that. But Judah wants to share her fruit sna- his fruit snacks with her, and she doesn't want them. And so what does he do? He forces her to, he's trying to force some fruit snacks into her mouth, and in shock, she's throwing a fit, right? Judah's not a good judge. Mom needs to come in as the good judge to say, thank you for sharing, but she doesn't want that, right? Understand, when we judge, when we took on that mantle of judge, we began to filter everything we saw through our own perspective. We see in part. We see according to the wounds, the the way that we feel. We see according to the outward actions that they're given. We don't see the inward workings of their heart. Okay, we don't see the full picture. When we take up a mantle of judge, we're doing so prematurely because we don't possess full knowledge of what's going on. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're not a good judge. That was the problem with taking up this mantle, but um, but we're hurt, right? We want to see justice be done. You something was wrong. You've wronged me. And justice needs to happen. Can I tell you, can I encourage you um, that we have a really good judge? The Lord is a really good judge. Okay? There is, maybe you don't know this, but there is not one sin that you have committed, and nor one sin that has been committed against you that will not be paid for. Okay? There is no sin that gets swept under the rug and ignored. Not one. Okay, I think that's what we think sometimes, that the Lord just erased them from the board and made them disappear. No, he, the price has been paid. The question is, who's going to pay it? Okay? Most of us are thankful. I hope you're thankful that Jesus paid the price for your sin. That we don't have to pay it. But here's a, here's a challenging question the Lord challenged me with. Are you okay if Jesus pays the price for what was done to you? Are you okay if your enemy doesn't suffer, but Jesus does instead? Okay, because Jesus said, and if you look at Isaiah 53, if you look at what Jesus took, he took not just the sins you've committed, but the ones that have been committed against you. He took your wounds. He took those on the cross too. All of that's been paid for. The Lord is a good judge, and we can trust him because he sees in full where we see in part. Okay? Okay? The Lord is a good judge, and you can trust him. And the Lord is a really good defender. I've learned a beautiful lesson over the last six months because there have been times where I have felt the need to exact justice on my behalf. And the Lord has said, stop, slow down, not your job. It's mine. And to watch him step in in a way that was far more beautiful and far less bloody than if I had stepped in on my own behalf. Do you see what I'm saying, though? Like, it's so beautiful to see that he would love to defend you, but understand that if you want him to defend you, you have to step out of the way. Okay? You have to get out of there. You need to step aside, lay down your desire for justice, and you need to love at the expense of justice. Okay? Does that make sense? You see what I'm saying? Okay, disclaimer, let me, let me just throw this in there. I'm not talking about healthy boundaries. There are some judgments that we as believers need to make, okay? There are some people um, in the body that we, we, we need to judge fruit, okay? We need to judge fruit in people's lives. But understand that the judgments we're called to make are in pursuit of love. It's with the intention to love, Okay, it's because I love you that I make this judgment. Even if that judgment means I'm removing you from the body right now or I'm removing you from the family right now. Sometimes we have to make those judgments. But understand, when you draw a healthy boundary, it's always to equip you to love. Okay, it's I'm putting what's sacred behind this line. 
I'm keeping this safe. I'm keeping my family safe. I'm keeping my time safe. I'm keeping my heart safe. I'm keeping my value safe. And I'm drawing this line, but my intention is to love you. Okay? And I'm making this judgment and I'm making it in order to love you. Okay? Does that make sense? But what I am talking to is those of us who would draw a boundary as a means of punishment. Because I've seen this happen too. Okay? I've done it. I'm going to withhold something from you because you've harmed me. Does that make sense? That's not a healthy boundary. That's a wall. And it's a form of punishment. And it doesn't set anyone free. Okay? Um, so I'm talking about a way, I'm talking about this specific kind of judgment, the judgment that determines someone's value and seeks to punish. Does that make sense? Do you, are you following me? Are you with me? Okay. So, what are we called to do? These are the verses that I've been pondering, and they have been shaking me to my core. So I'm sorry. Um, but here they are. Um, I'm reading most of these in the Passion Translation. Um, Proverbs 12.10 says this, Hatred keeps old quarrels alive, but love draws a veil over every insult and finds a way to make sin disappear. That means that what has been done against you, I'm going to cover it up. I'm going to pretend like it didn't happen. Okay, I can do that because I have a good judge, right? I can do that because I have a judge who defends me. So for me, I can. I have a new nature. I can make sin disappear. I can cover what they've done to me, okay? 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Above all, constantly echo God's intense love for one another, for love will be a canopy over a multitude of sins. Love covers sin. It doesn't expose it. It doesn't go tell everybody about it. Okay, it doesn't post it on Facebook. Don't, I told, okay, don't hate me. I might be teaching you not to hate, hate me at the end of this message. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> love covers it up. Pretends like it didn't happen. Because you can. Because you don't need to judge. Because you don't need to punish. You don't need to make them pay. Okay, Colossians 3.13 says, Make allowance for each other's faults. Nobody has faults in here, do they? Nobody, right? Nobody has faults, right? <laughs> no, but make allowances for one another's faults. Make allowances. Realize that it's okay that they have faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Make allowances for one another's faults. I see most people, they, they um, excuse people from their group because of their faults rather than make allowances for their faults. We need to make allowances for one another's faults. Understand, if we do this, this is what we were designed for. There's a reason Jesus asked us for this. Remember, he didn't design us for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't design us to be judged. That's a mantle that's too heavy for us to carry. Okay, it's a mantle we've, t we've carried for too long, to be honest. It's one that we need to lay down. What he did design us for, though, if he didn't design us to be judged, what he did design us for is relationships. He designed us to love one another. That's why he says, you will be my disciples if you love one another. That's why he says that, because it's what we were designed for. We were designed for a relationship with the Father and the relationship with one another. This is our original design. So when we do these things, we're returning to what we were made for. This is important. This is something that we need to do. Okay? Um, but how do we do this? Um, how do we do this? Here's, here's the problem. We will be, if we don't figure this out, we will be continually muscling our, our car onto the road. Okay? We have to get under the hood and figure out why what's going on underneath so that we can get our car into alignment again and that this could come net like okay it's possible can i just say that it's possible for it to be natural for you to love your enemy to be to love the one who offended you today it should it should be natural it's in your nature 
Okay, but we need to figure out how to get there. Okay, so this is what the journey of the Lord took me on. How do we do this, okay? Um, the problem is our need, our desire to defend ourself, our, our self-defense mode is motivated out of lack. Okay, there's something within us that has been poked, prodded, nudged, withheld from us, and it's causing us to go into self-defense mode. I need to fill what's empty in me, and you're doing it wrong right? This is what motivates us. This is why we hate people, because I need to withhold love from you to punish you and try to get you into alignment with what I knew. It's like, it's like Judah, I'm sharing, I'm being kind, and you're doing it wrong. Here, let me shove it into your mouth, right? This is what we do sometimes, okay? This is what we do. It's motivated out of lack. We have things that we were designed for. We were designed to be loved, we were designed to be loved. We were designed to be known and heard. We were designed to be chosen. Okay? And on top of it, the Lord made us all different. Go figure, right? He made us all with something different that makes us tick inside. Okay? Maybe, maybe you desire for power. The Lord designed you to be powerful. He gave you authority. Okay? Maybe the Lord has designed you to, that you pursue unity. You pursue peace. Okay? The Lord designed you on like that for a purpose. There's something within you, and somebody has not met that need, or they've hit a wound in you. Something's happened that they've done that, and you've gone into self-defense mode. So now, instead of being equipped to take care of them, you're trying to take care of you. Okay? But here's the problem with that. When we go into a mode like this, when we are in self-defense mode, the problem is that we are looking outside to fill something inside. We are looking to people to fill something within us. Here's the problem with that. People were designed to be a shadow of the original. They were designed to be a shadow of the creator. And here's the thing about shadows, okay? Um, if I were to go take my fist and I were to punch Taylor in the arm, it might hurt, maybe. But if I were to, what if I were to take my shadow and punch him? Anybody, like, feel sorry for him? Thank you. This is not a trick question. Um, <laughs> nobody's really intimidated of somebody's shadow, or at least they, at least they shouldn't be, because um, a shadow bears the image of the original, but it lacks the power. Okay? People were designed to be a shadow of their creator. They were designed to look like their creator. So in our carnal mind, we begin to look to people to fill something, but their only design was to point you back to the Father. Okay? That was their only design. A good God would not design you with lack, with desires with needs if he did not intend to fill them. Can I say that again? Because I think you all need to get that. Okay? The Lord would not design you with lack. He would not design you with needs. He would not design you deficient if he did not intend to satisfy you. Okay? This is why he designed you that way, because he intended to be that for you. Okay? So, Proverbs 10.3 says, The Lord satisfies the longings of all his lovers, but he withholds from the wicked what their souls crave. Okay, and when I say that, can I just say that that's an act of mercy, that the Lord would withhold from the wicked? Because if they found satisfaction in the shadow, they'll never find the power of the original. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so, but the Lord satisfies the longings of all his lovers, his intention is to satisfy you. That's always been his intention, okay? The lovers of God, Proverbs 13, 25, the lovers of God will have more than enough, but the wicked will always lack what they crave. This is God's intentions towards you. His intentions are to satisfy you. But can I tell you that I've met few people, very, very, very few people, with the audacity to actually believe that the Lord is enough 
we sing about it often. I've seen many, I've heard many songs, all I need is you. You're all I need, you're all I want. We've seen many songs about it, but I've seen few people actually live like it. Can I tell you we're called to? And if we don't live like this, we will never fulfill our full potential. Nor will we ever be fully satisfied. Okay, the Lord intends to satisfy you, but if you never tap into him and discover you are enough for me, you'll never be satisfied. Okay, but it's what he has for you. Okay, so what does this look like? I, um, there was a time that, um, before Taylor and I started dating, that I, um, this is, is, this is our funny story, forgive me. Um, everyone wants to hear these stories, right? <laughs> um, so when he first came to church here, he started kind of pursuing me um, as like friends, but I kind of knew there was a little bit, you know, you know there's always some, something under the surface. Um, <laughs> those evil guys. <laughs> But I was at a stage in my walk that I was learning how to be satisfied in the Lord. And I wanted nothing to do with him because I'm good. I have Jesus and that's all I need. And so for months he kind of pursued me and I was like, yeah, no way. Go away. Um, well, then one day the Lord was like, hey, maybe that's me. And I was like, oh, you do that? You know, like... <laughs> Yeah, you do do that, don't you? And I was like, okay. And I started to kind of allow him to um, pay me attention. And I think as soon as I did that, um, Taylor panicked. Um, <laughs> he was like, oh, no, what did I get myself into? This is a pastor's daughter. She's been in church all her life. What am I, what am I doing? And he ran the other way. Um, So I was hurt. I was like, Lord, you told me maybe this is you, and here I go, and he runs the other way. Like, this is not what I wanted. <laughs> you know, like, I, would, I didn't want him to begin with. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I didn't say that publicly. I really didn't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I said no. You said yes. So <laughs> I'll find a way. <laughs> Um, anyway, but I was hurt, bottom line. I was hurt, um, and I didn't know why. Um, but I needed to respond and not react. So what I did was I went to a coffee shop by myself. I got away from my roommates, away from everybody, and I sat down with a journal, and I started to write down everything that was going on, everything that he said, everything that I said, you know, and this is what I thought, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just writing it out with the Lord. And I finally wrote down the words I needed to hear or that I needed to know. Um, and I said, I feel so rejected. I feel so rejected. Okay, understand, you and I weren't made for rejection. We were made to be chosen. Okay, and in that moment, I had a choice of how I was going to respond to this, okay? If I were to react out of my carnal nature, my carnal nature would do anything possible to make him accept me. Okay? I'm going to do whatever's possible to shove that fruit snack in his face. <laughs> right? I'm going to control, I'm going to manipulate, I'm going to do what I have to to make you do the right thing, or... I'm going to put you in your place beneath me. Because if you're beneath me, you can't hurt me and I feel more powerful. Okay, I've seen a lot of people do this. Okay, I've seen like the posts on Facebook that 10 times people were roasted on Facebook and put in their place, you know? And, and we, we love to read those and we laugh because yeah, put them in their place, you know? But, but it's a form of punishment. It's hate. It's not a gift of love, okay? Um, it's, it's, um, it's a mode of self-defense. I need to make myself feel more powerful, so I'm going to make you feel small. Okay, that's, that's what that could be. That could have been my response to Taylor. But I did something different, and this is what we need to do. I, I realized in that moment my deficiency. I realized where I was out of alignment. I felt rejected. And I allowed the Lord to choose me. I realized I knew before this that the Lord was enough. 
I knew he could satisfy me, and I knew Taylor couldn't. So, but I realized in that moment, I was looking to Taylor for acceptance, and that was the wrong place to look. And I began to shift my focus in that moment, and I began to look at the Lord. And I say, I need you to choose me, and he began to do it so well. Okay, understand, nobody can satisfy you the way that Jesus can. Nobody can love you. Nobody can put you in a position of authority. Nobody can put you into your full potential. Nobody can see your value or your worth. No one can hear your voice. No one can bring unity. No one can bring peace the way that Jesus can. Okay? If we continue to look to the wrong sources to find satisfaction, we will never change anything and we will live our whole lives in a mode of self-defense. But that's not what we were designed for. If you want to muscle your car onto the road, good job, great, go for it, please do it. But I want you to know you don't have to live there. Your muscles get real tired. Okay, it's really hard to continue like that. You don't have to. You can be satisfied. You can be fully satisfied in Jesus. And if we are fully satisfied in Jesus, then understand that puts me in a position to love. If I'm not in a self-defense mode, I can think, how can I give a gift of love? And the next time I met Taylor, I was able to do that. But if I hadn't, I would have reacted the same way all the other women had ever reacted in his life. And I had to be different. Okay, otherwise we wouldn't be married with two kids today. Okay, our marriage is different because we live like this. Our marriage is different because I understand he's not enough for me. But Jesus is. Okay, Jesus is enough. So, why is this so important? This is um, my final point, and hopefully I can explain it quickly. I told y'all, y'all were going to get more than the last service. <laughs> going longer already. Um, why is this important, okay? If we don't figure this out, we will never walk in unity. And can I tell you how important that is to Jesus? Okay, if we don't figure out how to love the other people, we will never walk in unity. What I see people do is um, rather than love the people that don't think like them, they, they bond with like-minded people. Okay, and, and, and I understand why it's good, it's natural to, to bond with the people that know you, um, the bond, to bond with people that think like you, but understand that the only result of bonding with just those people is division. Okay, it's, it's like the cliques in high school. Y'all like those? Y'all enjoy those? Anybody like those? Anybody ever outside the cliques in high school? That was me. <laughs> and that doesn't feel good either, right? Okay. Church cannot look like high school. We, we, we can't do that. Okay, we can't do that. Um, there was an illustration that actually a teacher gave. Can my mother bring me, thank you, my balloon. She, uh, there was a teacher that did an uh, illustration with her class, or a, an experiment, if you will, with, your cl with, her, with her class. And she gave everybody a balloon, and she told everybody to put their name on it. And then she had everybody take their balloon and go throw it out in the hallway, okay? So now there's a mess of balloons in the hallway, right? And then she says, I'm going to time you guys, and I want to see how quickly you guys can run out into the hallway and find your balloon and come back to your seat. So she gets them ready. She sets them up and says, go. And as soon as she says, go, everybody screeches out of their seats. They start running like a mad dash to the hallway. People are shoving people aside. Who can do it faster, you know? And there's competition. There's climbing over people. Let's throw in balloons everywhere. Crazy, right? Finally, everybody gets their balloon and comes back to their seats. There might be one or two black eyes or bloody noses, but not too bad. Um, and everybody sits down in their seat and she times them and it's like, you know, maybe five to ten minutes or something like that. Um, a lot of chaos, a lot of confusion. A lot of frustration. Um, finally, she says, let's do it one more time. Everybody go throw your balloons out in the hallway. So everyone goes and throws their balloons back in the hallway. And she says, okay, but I'm going to change the rules on you this time. This time I don't want you to find your balloon. I want you to go out find one balloon and return it to its owner. Can you picture how different that moment was? When she said, go, now it's not me against them, but we're a team 
and I'm going to find one balloon. I don't need to go, I don't need to go dodging through everybody's balloon to find mine. I just need to find one. And everybody got their balloon, right? Do you see the difference? Okay, when I, before I got um, married, I was, I was with a friend, and she was getting married, and we, one of the things that we did to celebrate her um, upcoming marriage was we um, got marriage advice from, like, five people. And the overwhelming consensus among all the married couples was um, marriage is give and take. And I was pondering that. A couple days later, we were at church. I was actually even right over here. I remember it distinctly, the moment that the Lord spoke this to me. Um, He said, you know, marriage is not give and take. Marriage is give and receive. Because take implies a transaction mentality. I give to you with the expectation that you're going to give back to me. Okay, that I get to take something from you. Okay, I do the dishes so that you will take out the trash. Right? I do this for you so that you'll do this for me. I say this to you so that you'll say this to me, right? But that is not love. Because love is a gift always. And the Lord says to me, love is give and receive. Because give and receive means the expectation I bring to the relationship is that I'm going to give to you, okay? The person that walked out into the hallway didn't have an expectation of even who was going to give them a balloon. They didn't get mad at the teacher because the teacher didn't bring them their balloon, but they received their balloon from someone, right? Can you imagine, can you imagine a relationship that the only expectation they bring is to give? Would anybody have lack? Think about it. If everybody came with the expectation of giving, who would go without? Does that make sense? Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, if we can k- grab onto this as a body, if we can grab onto this as a church, okay, that we're going to love the people around us, that we're going to pursue people, do, do you realize that nobody would be forgotten? If we all did it, who would be left out? What if when we came to church, rather than walk into the building saying, I need this, this, this today, And I'm expecting these people to say this to me. I'm expecting this number of people to say hello to me. I'm expecting this number of people to give me a prophecy. I'm expecting these worship songs to be perfect. What if rather than we walked in like that, we walked in and we picked up a balloon? And we asked the Lord, whose balloon do I hold today? What if that's the way that we approached church? Okay, do you realize that Jesus said, you, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. This begins here. It begins with you and I. Okay, if we can do this, I guarantee you it will transform church culture. And it won't stop here. It won't stop here. What if the balloon you pick up is someone you don't like? What if it's someone who offended you Can you get under the hood? Can you allow the Lord to be your judge and your defender? Can you allow him to satisfy you? And can you give the balloon anyway? With a joyful heart. Because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Right? Can you do that? I've got one more verse for you, then I would like to pray over you, and then I'll invite Pastor back on stage. Um, Pastor, uh, Proverbs eleven twenty seven says, live in your life seeking what is good for others brings untold favor. But those who wish for evil for others will find it coming back on them. Those who wish to punish somebody else and make them pay for what they did, they often find it coming back on them. There's no, there's no life in that kind of lifestyle. Okay? But those who seek what's good for others even for their enemy. It brings untold favor. So can I pray over you guys? Dear Heavenly Father, we, we, we submit our lives to you. We ask that you would do something new in our hearts. We ask that you'd open up our eyes to the potential, the untapped potential of your goodness. That we would step into who we are in you. 
that we would step into all that you have for us and that we would not live our lives empty. We would li not live our lives hurt, but that, Lord, you would come and that you would heal us. You would do something new in our hearts, and I pray, Lord, that you would empower us, that you would teach us how to tap into the nature that you've put within us and that we would be equipped, we would be empowered to love in a way we've never loved before in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Great job, Hannah. So whose balloon do you hold? You know, I pop back in here and Colleen texted me and goes, can you come teach the kids? And I'm like, no. <laughs> No, but I already heard this message, and I'm going like, you know what? I'm going to go hold the balloon with all the kids' names on it. And we went back there, and I got to teach them about being born again, what does it mean, and, and different things like that. You know, it's being available. And you think about it, the Lord has a balloon with your name on it. And love at the expense of justice. This is what the Lord did. He absorbed all of our sin and gave us grace. He absorbed our sin and gave us life. And he asked us to just do the same thing. Can we absorb people's sin and give them grace? Because the only reason, the only person who knows really why they're ornery, mean, or angry, and all this other kind of stuff is the Lord. Because we think about it, you've been a jerk too. And nobody knows why, but you do, and the Lord does, and he ministers to you and things like that. You know what I'm saying? We've, we've all been there. We all deserve judgment. But the Lord gave us grace, and, and really that's what he wants us to do. And for anybody watching online right now or anybody in this room, if you've, if you've never accepted or received that goodness of God, that forgiveness of sin, and, and that new life that only he can give, today's your day. Because it's not a matter, matter what you can do to undo your sin. It's not a matter of how, how much penance can I do to just really prove I'm sorry for my sin. No, this is all about you being rescued because the Lord picked up your name, the balloon with your name on it and said, I'm just gonna love you. And I'm gonna give you life for your sin, for your death. You see, nobody goes to hell because of sin, not one person. Why? Because all sin is paid for. It's already paid for. So I got really good news for you. You're not being rejected by God. Because he will accept you. Well, how do I how do I get that? Great question. The Bible says that if I can just believe, if I can believe that Jesus Christ lived on this earth, he was that he came, he was born of a virgin, that he lived on this earth. And you know, there's more proof that he lived than Julius Caesar, and we really believe that Julius Caesar lived. And we have a lot more proof that Jesus lived. We have his writings, we have volumes of books, even history books, that talk about Jesus and his life and the things that he said. And if you can believe that, can you believe what he said? If I can believe that he lived, I also have to believe that he was either a crazy man or he was the son of God because he went around telling everybody he was a, the son of God. He went around telling people there's no way to the Father except through me. You're going to have to accept my life. And literally, that's how easy it is to walk in forgiveness of sin, to walk in newness of life, is to recognize the one who paid the price for your sin and recognize the one who's going to give you life. The prayer can be as simple as, I don't want me, but I want you. It could be as simple as, hey, everything's going great, but I still know I need you because I have sinned. And there's a prayer we're going to pray together right now. All of us will do it together. And if you're here and you've never done it before, guess what? It's a simple little prayer. But if you don't mean it, there's going to be a miracle that's going to take place inside of you. The love that God has is going to be put in your heart so that now you can have different responses in life and you can have a relationship with the true and living God. Just say this with me. Dear God, I believe Jesus is your son. 
I believe he died on the cross to pay for my sin. And I've sinned. I need to be forgiven. So Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you're alive. And I believe you paid the price. So I accept that now. Thank you for forgiving me. And I surrender to you. You're now my Lord. And I choose to live for you. I ask for that miracle of that new birth. And I ask that you fill me with your spirit. I want to be a part of your kingdom. So I don't, I turn my back on sin. And I choose you. I turn my back on the ways of this world and I choose your ways. So thank you. Amen. It is really that simple. If you meant that, a miracle took place on the inside of you. Now, if you're in this room and you want us to pray with you, there's a connect card in the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and put it into offering boxes or you can go to the website and everybody watching online, you can go to the website resonline.org, R-E-S, online.org, and you'll see right on the front page a button that says Got Saved. You push that, and there's seven teachings there, me just getting you started on the right steps, and we'll give you more directions after that, but it's just a perfect way to get this new life started the right way. Amen? A couple of announcements. Jared's going to give this to you right now by video, and then if you need prayer, please come on up. Don't leave here with a need, question, whatever. We'll be up here front ready to pray with you. And so watch this, and then you'll be dismissed. Thank you. Hey, guys, my name is Jared, and welcome to your weekly church announcements. The first thing I want to say is if you didn't already know, this week, Wednesday, our children in our New Directions program are putting on a talent show. So the past few weeks, the New Directions program has been putting on tons of classes for our children here at the church, and they are finally going to get to showcase everything that they've learned. So please show up. It'll be here at Resonate at 7 p.m. this week, Wednesday. And speaking of the children, next week, Sunday on October 30th, the children are having an 80s day in Children's Church. So get your kids an 80s costume and dress up like your favorite 80s character. It's going to be a ton of fun back there in Kids Church. Next up, we have Woven Sisterhood and it's coming up quick. We have it next week, Tuesday, October 1st. Woven Sisterhood is a fantastic ministry at the church for our women. They get together once a month and they just have really close knit community with one another. I recommend going if you're a girl, if you're not a girl, please don't show up. But next week, Tuesday, November 1st, be there at 7 p.m. Then later that weekend, we have Kairos. Now Kairos is a huge event for us, not only for us at the church, but for you guys as well. We would love to see you there to get freedom and really take steps in your walk with Christ. This event is huge spiritually and I personally get so many things every time I go. If you haven't been to a Kairos event, please come. It's going to be so amazing. You can register online at our website, resonline.org, or they have more information at the Connections Desk. If you have already been to Kairos, you know how much you'll love it and I think you'll get so much more from coming again. So Kairos is next weekend, November 4th and 5th, Friday and Saturday. There is more info on our website. Next up, you guys need to get out your calendars and get ready to mark them because we are doing baptisms again. On Sunday, November 13th, we are going to be heading over to the Fremont Rec Center to be doing baptisms. Again, like always, there's going to be a class the week before during second service on November 6th going over what baptisms are and what they mean. So if you or somebody you know wants to get baptized, now is the perfect time. If you want more information on baptisms, you can head over to our Connections Desk and they will have information for you. That is all I have for our upcoming bigger events, but I do want to throw a little shout out in there for our current ongoing events. For men, we have men's ministry going on every Monday night at 7 p.m. They have just a couple weeks left in their study, so if you're looking for a men's group, definitely check that out. 
For the women, we have women's study. They are currently going through the book of Romans and they have a study that happens every week, Thursday at 9.30 a.m. and 7 p.m. So if you're looking for a women's group, definitely check out the women's Bible study. And we also have our 11th step program that happens every week Thursday at 7 p.m. in the conference room. If you need any more information on any of these current events, please check out our connections desk or our website. Thank you guys so much for joining me and I will see you next week.